I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Frank Tipler, a mathematical physicist and cosmologist holding a joint appointment in the Departments of Mathematics and Physics at Tulane University. Dr. Tipler has a bachelor's in physics from MIT and a PhD from the University of Maryland with postdoctoral work under the distinguished physicists John Archibald Wheeler, Abraham Taub, Rainier Sachs, and Dennis Siama. He became an associate professor in mathematical physics in 1981 and a full professor in 1987 at Tulane University, where he has been a faculty member ever since. Dr. Tipler is known for the theories of the Tipler cylinder time machine, as well as his work on the Omega Point, which we'll be discussing today. So, Frank, welcome. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to have you with me. So, today we are discussing the Omega Point, a theoretical future event in which the entirety of the universe spirals towards a final point of unification. So can you start us out with kind of an overview of the concept, I guess, to help the audience understand it a little better? Well, I originally uh, worked it out um, for my book with John Barrow on the anthropic cosmological principle. I was investigating all possible um, relationships between Intelligent Life in the Universe, Humankind and the Universe, for that book. And one of the possibilities that struck me was inspired by an important paper by Freeman Dyson, in which he proposed that if the universe were to expand forever, it might be possible for life, if it were clever, to avoid the heat death in which all life would die out. This was the general belief at the end of the 19th century. Bertrand Russell wrote a piece called A Poor Man's Worship, and he said, we're just going to have to get used to the idea that our civilization, all our life, everything we care about is going to be totally doomed and wiped out. That's a terrible, depressing idea. Is it necessary? Dyson said, well, if the universe were to expand forever, we could move out and um, maybe we could survive forever. Now, I wondered what would happen if the universe were closed? Typical closed universes expand to a maximum size and then recontract into a final singularity. And I realized in order for life to go on to the very end in such a universe, it would have to have unlimited communication. Unlimited communication means there can't be event horizons. Event horizons means limits to communication. Therefore, no event horizons. What does that mean mathematically? Aha! It means Penrose had to uh, describe different topologies which would apply to a singularity. If there were no event horizons in that topology in the Penrose C boundary topology, that's complicated mathematics, would have to be a point. Aha! Teilhard de Chardin proposed that the very end of the universe would be at a mega point. So I'll call this point in the C boundary topology of Penrose the omega point. So it was inspired by the idea that life would literally go on forever. In my book, The Physics of Your Mortality, I followed this up by postulating that life would go on forever. But now I can do better than that. I can prove that this has to happen, that life has to come into existence, expand and engulf the universe, and control it all the way into the omega point. The laws of physics are going to require us to do precisely that. Wonderful, wonderful. That is an amazing just overview of it. And, you know, I should mention a lot of this material was actually in the online resources when I was doing research for it, but the way that it was cited was not structured the way that you've presented it. So it was it was very much backwards. And so I, again, thank you so much for laying this out for us. So the, the term Omega Point was originally invented by the French Jesuit Catholic priest, Pierre Teilhard de Jardin, who framed it in theological terms, if I understand it correctly. And then your work is really taking that and basing this on physics and computation. So I guess one thing I should ask is, how much did Deschardins work influence what you've done? And would you describe- No influence whatsoever, except the term. Okay, except okay. Also, he had an idea of bringing theology into it. Yeah. Now, if you think about it, it's obvious that the singularity is a supernatural being who created the universe out of nothing. Now, let's break that down. Let's consider first the initial singularity which began the universe. 
Now, the great mathematician, Sir Edmund Whitaker, realized in the year I was born, and I'm no spring chicken, I think you can see that, um, that the proofs for the existence of God by St. Thomas Aquinas were really what we mathematicians call sequence completion arguments. Mm, okay. That's a complicated uh, um, phrase, but let's see how it works. Let's take, take um, Aquinas's second way. The argument from first cause. Excuse me. I'll call back later. It's emergency right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These things happen. Um, everything today in the universe is strictly caused by an earlier state of the universe. And that earlier state is caused by a yet earlier state, which is called yet by another earlier state. Do you see we have a sequence of causes? Now, you keep going back until physics says you can't go any further. That will be the beginning of the cause. But notice the sequence itself defines something outside the cause. So it's not inside the universe. It's on the edge of the universe. Now, the word supernatural literally means outside of nature, outside of space and time. That's what this initial cause, which has no cause, causing everything in the universe. So what we have, and this is Whitaker's point, we have using modern physics a much more powerful argument for the existence of an uncaused first cause, which is a supernatural being, which controls everything that happens in the universe than Aquinas did. So that's why I said, aha, maybe there's some theology in this too. And there is. Now, you can do the same thing in the future direction, getting the final cause, which is the Omega point. Now, it turns out when you bring in quantum mechanics to this, you see the multiverse, that's all of the... the, the Reality is not a single universe, but an uncountable infinity of universes that's required by quantum mechanics. And you see when you bring the multiverse, there is a third singularity out there which connects these three. So what you really have is three singularities in one topology distinct, but in another topology, they're really just one singularity. So what you've really got is a triune god coming directly from the physics. Now, what I want to emphasize here, of course, Christianity asserts that God is three persona, but actually the entire early human race asserted the same thing, believe it or not. For example, if you go to the holy book of the Muslims, the Quran, the Quran is divided like the Christian Bible into chapters, only they call them surah. If you go to the star surah, you will find the three names of the ancient Arabic triune god. In the Norse tradition, to go to the other part, far north rather than the around the equator, you will find the Norse triune god. Ertha, Bastandi, Skult are the three names of the Norse triune god. So you've got Christianity and you've got all the religions coming out of the basic physics. There is one singularity governing everything. But this is just the theological um, implications. I'm more interested in the mathematical and physics implications of this. Now, one way you can say the same thing as life going on forever is, is it possible to construct a universal computer? The universal Turing machine is an example, the first example we realize of a universal computer. What's the difference between an ordinary computer and a universal computer? A universal computer has unlimited memory. In the original Turing version, you had an unlimited tape, but what's a tape? Just something to record something. You, there's an old saying, if you ever deal with a com your, your computer, Blast it, I don't have enough memory. That's yeah. always the case. And what you want to have a universal computer is unlimited memory. Now, what I ask is what must the universe be like in order to allow that? Now, one of the problems 
which has been thrown against my omega point theory, that the universe will collapse into a singularity, is that um, the universe is now accelerating. If the universe were to accelerate or even expand forever, then my omega point theory collapses. It can't be true. Let's hold that for a second and think about... Well and, and Frank, actually, if I could jump in, and again, I oh, want yeah. to try and provide a little bit of background for the audience, as, as well as clarify things for myself. So what I've read in the past is, again, you'd mentioned the Big Bang. Everybody's heard about the Big Bang, right? And that's your initial singularity. And wow. you were saying, it, rightfully so, something created that, right? There's something on the edge of that. So it starts with the Big Bang. Singularity we, is the creator. It, we so we go through we go through inflation. We have we have inflation. We have the, I, the I universe. I deny that. I don't think we have inflation. Ah, because, okay. Uh, because the crucial thing, inflation is a force that's never been seen in the laboratory. Everybody agrees on that. The question is, can everything which is accomplished by inflation be accomplished by known laws of physics, which have been confirmed in the laboratory? My claim is yes, and I developed that in a very long paper published in um, 20, 2005 in Reports in Progress in Physics. Basically, inflation does nothing. So really, the whole universe just started as it was thought before inflation theory came at an adjusted initial singularity and expanded rapidly out of that. Quantum mechanics is getting the flatness of the universe, not inflation. And the homogeneity and isotropy, homogeneity means the density is about the same everywhere in the universe. And um, isotropy means it looks the same um, everywhere in the universe. It was generally thought before inflation that this was not possible because you cannot send light rays across the universe. That's certainly true. In the very early universe, there are what are called particle horizons. But I showed in my 05 paper that quantum field theory, global aspect of it, forces the homogeneity and isotropy of the universe. So these properties, which are supposedly due to inflation, are due to known physics, which has already been established in the laboratory. Quantum ah. field theory, way packet spreading. Okay. Well, so, so, and, and thank you for clarifying that. So uh, what I want to, I guess my, my thought though is, um, to kind of continue this, we, we have the universe now and it can go one of two ways. And that's kind of what you're getting into. That's That really takes us to the omega point. One of these is, um, as Freeman Dyson had talked about, heat death, right? It can continue to spread out and lose energy. It just dissipates in, and eventually just everything stops. Or alternatively, it ends in what's been called the big crunch, right? Where basically that the the expansion reverses over time and it collapses back into a singularity. Now, I, I'm gonna throw this, I don't want to, I don't want to cause trouble for myself or you, but I want to throw this in there. I have read speculation that the universe may be a never-ending cycle of big bangs and big crunches. Do you think that might be the case? Violates the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, because if you have a cyclic time, and I'm completely familiar with this work, um, the most recent prominent person pushing it is uh, um, my own mentor, one of them, and a very great man, Roger Penrose, wrote a book, Cycles of Time. Um, but if you have a cycle, a cyclic universe, the entropy of the universe would have to decrease. It would have to go back to a value in previous times. But the second law of thermodynamics says the Entropy of the universe can never decrease. So a cyclic universe would violate the second law. And Penrose knows this perfectly well. So he is explicit in throwing out the second law. He is going to um, get rid of the second law. He's very explicit in how he's going to get rid of it by violating yet another law of physics called unitarity. And if the conservation of energy law holds, unitarity has to be true. So Conservation of energy is expressed in the first law of thermodynamics. So Roger is getting rid of um, the possibility of a final singularity by throwing out two laws of physics, the first and second law of thermodynamics, and incidentally, unitarity. Okay, okay. So 
What now you were talking about computation, and that is one of the things that is very interesting to me. I, I've been a big fan of Ray Kurzweil's work, and I'm sure that you've probably read that, right? Kurzweil and Moravec and accelerating change, accelerating computation. It seems like that dovetails into what you're talking about as well, that computation over time will basically continue to increase and take over the entire universe. Can you can you elaborate on that a bit? Well, I once told Hans Moravec that um, he handles the next million years, and I take it from there. Um, so, yes, they naturally uh, dovetail. Um, he's going to be concerned with just spreading out um, throughout the galaxy um, and doing computation on that scale. But then you ask the question, what happens then? And beyond that, you have to keep going until the very end of time when the laws of physics say you can't go any further. And that is what a singularity is. You can't go through a singularity. Laws of physics said it all ends here. Okay, so let me first prove that um, the universe has to end in a final singularity. Now, once again, this assumes the laws of physics. Throughout the laws of physics, I can't say anything. Well, the first step is to go through Steve Hawking's important work on black hole evaporation. Now, I went through his calculations, so we have a lot of people, and we are convinced he got it right. Black holes indeed evaporate. But Hawking went further. Namely, he showed that were a black hole to evaporate to completion, then it would violate unitarity. It would destroy information. Now, I've just mentioned unitarity follows from the law of conservation of energy, but it's worse than that. Um, Suskin at um, Stanford showed that if you had energy non-conservation by unitarity violation, that energy violation conservation would um, exponentiate. It wouldn't be just a tiny amount of energy violation. It would grow exponentially. He arbitrarily cut it off at the Planck length, but I applied it um, to a conducting wire. And I showed that were you to flip a light switch, so much energy would be created by this unitarity violating process that the earth would be blown apart. I think we can agree that does not happen. So unitarity is good. But Hawking showed that were a black hole to evaporate to completion, it would violate unitarity. But unitarity is good. What's the solution to that? If the universe were to accelerate or even expand forever, inevitably black holes, which we see plenty of, would evaporate to completion. Therefore, the universe cannot expand or accelerate forever. It must end in a final singularity before any black hole has a chance to evaporate. Now, uh, let's follow the process into the final singularity. Now, um, Jacob Beckenstein proved an interesting theorem that were there to be event horizons, then his Beckenstein bound representation of quantum field theory would force the entropy of the universe to go to zero as you're going into that final singularity. But we've already mentioned the second law of thermodynamics does not permit entropy from going to zero. Therefore, it is not possible to have any event horizons. Therefore, the laws of physics, which have been well established in the laboratory, say the universe must end in an omega point with no event horizons. Now, you can ask the question globally, how is it possible for event horizons to disappear? It is a remarkable theorem proven by uh, Malcolm McCallum, oh, about 40 odd years ago, that um, there is one way in which event horizons can disappear. The technical term is caster crushing, but I won't worry with the, with the details of this. But roughly what happens, the universe collapses very rapidly in two directions, but it stops collapsing in the other direction, and you can have light going around in that direction where it doesn't um, collapse. 
Then mm -hmm. you switch to another direction. It stops um, contracting in that direction while it contracts even faster in the other two directions. This process repeats over and over an infinite number of times, and there no event arises. The problem with this, as Malcolm McCallum uh, pointed out, is that if you had a purely undirected process, the problem, the likelihood that this would occur is zero. But approaching zero probability is just another way of saying the second law is being violated, second law of thermodynamics. But if you have living organisms in control of the universe, they are going to naturally want to force these disappearance of the event horizons because the contraction, in addition to being able to communicate in this direction, the rapid contraction in the other two directions allow, give you an infinite energy source. So they're ah. going to be motivated to do this. They're going to be motivated by the simple desire to survive. So they're going to force the universe to do this. And then this measure zero, vastly improbable process becomes a maximum process, probability one, if life goes all the way into the singularity. So really, it's the second law of thermodynamics that's telling us life is going to exist all the way into the singularity. Now, life is what? Ultimately, it's just a form of information processing. We're bringing yeah. computers again in here. So what has to happen in order for this to occur is that life is, our computers, equivalent, are going to have to increase their memory literally without limit as you're going into the final singularity. So the laws of physics are basically telling us not only is life going on ultimately into the final singularity, infinite number of experiences in our way of measuring time, which is one physical way, it's going to be finite, oh, say a trillion, trillion years into the future. But in terms of experiential time, the experience of the beings there, they're going to see an infinite number of um, things happening. So in experiential time, in thermodynamic time, you'll be generating an infinite amount of entropy between now and the final state. It, the singularity is going to be infinitely far away, and you're going to have an infinite number of experiences between now and the final state. And okay. with an unlimited amount of computation, you can do all sorts of wonderful things. The Bekenstein bound, for example, tells us that the entire visible universe can be coded in a computer with 10 to the 123 bits. This was first computed by Roger Penrose, who was called the Penrose number. The total possible number of universes, 10 to the 10 to the 123 bits, but universes. But that's an enormous number. The key thing is that's finite. Finite is insignificant compared to infinity. So if you've got an infinite computer, if you've got an infinite amount of memory, huh, what's 10 to the 10 to the 123 bits? You can reproduce as virtual reality, as perfect copies of the world today, every possible universe that is out there in the multiverse. So the beings in the far future will have the power to bring us back into existence in virtual reality. And given unlimited computer memory, we need never die again. So. Well so, so I this is related, if I understand correctly, to Freeman Dyson's eternal intelligence scenario. So, in his case, he was saying that an immortal society of intelligent beings in an open universe can escape the prospect of heat death by performing an infinite number of computations, expending only a finite amount of energy. So, in your case, actually, in your case, it's a closed universe model. But if there is an infinite amount of experience, an infinite amount of computation, really no one ever reaches the singularity experientially, right? Correct. That's correct. Now, remember, I've just proven that uh, the universe cannot be opened because it contradicts unitarity and the existence of black holes and Hawking's calculation that evaporating black hole, if it evaporates to com completion, would violate unitarity. Now, Freeman Dyson did not know this when he was working out his um, work, but I do know that, so I've brought in this additional physics to tell us the universe 
has to be closed. Now, why do I say closed? Really, I haven't proven that yet. All I've shown is the universe has to contract to a final singularity. An open universe can do that too, if you have the right physics. But here's the interesting fact. It is a mathematical theorem that if you have no event horizons, the universe has to be closed. So we now know, given there are no event horizons, which is required for two things, a final singularity and the second law of thermodynamics that forces no event horizons, no event horizons forces the universe to be closed. So the laws of physics are dovetailing all together, telling me the omega point theory has to be true. Amazing. Amazing. The laws there, there, of physics be for us, who can be against us? Yeah, there, there is so much to this, you know, and we are bouncing around. I, I found so much information to build into questions. So I'm going to put this into notes and I'm going to reference your book as well. One thing I did want to ask about was, and this is something that you have done as well as um, I've seen this as a trend in information theory. You're treating computation as a, a thing or almost like a substance rather than being kind of a product, I guess, or a pattern, if that makes sense. I'm not expressing that. I, I agree with you that information is a pattern. But remember that if the first and second laws are coupled, so to speak. What this, I like to say the second law governs information and the first law governs substance. Mm. But remember, we still have to have substance. We have to have substance there to code the information. Nothing to code on. We're not going to code anything. You know, you have to have a computer there in order to put a pattern in the computer. That's the way to think about it. So uh, I am totally agreement with you that um, information is nothing but a pattern in matter. But the matter has to be there. You have to have something to put the pattern into. But yeah. The second law tells us the second law is a law that governs patterns. So to create a bit of information, you have to process a bit of information, you really have to expend some energy. And energy conservation is the domain of the first law. So they're not totally independent, but then the laws of physics are not independent, all of them, because they are all integrated to govern this particular universe, which we find ourselves in. Laws of physics apply to all things all the time, and it's all the laws of physics simultaneously. There's a tendency of people to think, oh, physics, uh, th these laws govern on Tuesday and these laws govern on Wednesday. That's obvious nonsense, which is the way I expressed it that way. But um, the he came to realize that all the laws of physics apply simultaneously. And I agree with you totally. Information is a pattern, but a pattern in matter. Interesting. Well, every now and then I hear, and actually you just made, you just made one of those statements. Every now and then I hear one of those statements where like, you know, there's a bug in my brain. I'm going to chew on this one for a while, but the second law is the law of information, right? And so normally we think that is, information. yeah, we, we think of entropy, right? And that's, that's the way I've always approached it. Those laws were developed before information really had the relevance with the understanding that we have now, you know, in the computer age, but um, that is interesting because that seems like that might be able to expand more as well. And I'm sure that you have given this a ton more thought than definitely myself and probably more than most people out there. But this is something that I think people should put a pin in and think about. The second law is it governs information and perhaps there's a, a larger relationship or a new way of thinking about that that we haven't approached in the past. I'm going to make another comment. I'm going to make a comment that uh, on first blush, sounds um, very materialistic, that um, the um, brain is a computer and the mind, the soul, is a program running on this computer. Okay. Now, I think Kurzweil and uh, most um, atheists would agree with that. What is interesting is that if you look carefully at Christian doctrine, it's the same thing. St. Thomas Aquinas, which I think we can agree is a, a Christian, um, argued, taking the argument, taking the definition from Aristotle, that the soul is the form of activity of the body. 
here he was invoking a notion of Aristotle. Aristotle had four causes. Formal cause was one. Now, what is a formal cause? The formal cause is sort of like a blueprint that describes what you want to accomplish. That if you're um, knocking out a statue, you're a, uh, uh, a sculptor, um, you have the material cause, which is the uh, the material of uh, marble, if you're making out of it. Um, and you also have the efficient cause, which is you pounding on the, the marble. But then there is the uh, formal cause, which is the blueprint telling you how to um, pound that marble um, in order to establish the final cause, which is the finished uh, statue. These are the four causes. But the point is the formal cause, if you think about it, is in all intents and purposes equivalent to a computer program. They didn't have computers at the time of Aristotle, yeah. 400 BC. The closest he could come to it was this notion of a formal cause. But it's essentially the same. The soul is a computer program. Formal cause for him, computer program for us, but the basic idea is the same. So the soul is immaterial because it's a pattern in matter. It's not matter itself. It's the pattern inside the brain, partially from environment, partially from genes. We don't know exactly how they divide it up, but it's still the soul, the mind is a pattern in matter, immaterial. Ah, okay. And so then if we work this backwards, um, if we if we view the second law as information, basically the information becomes less organized in the universe over time. And what when we apply I energy... Would that. I would say this: what the second law says, remember S is equal to K log W. That's the Boltzmann expression for the entropy. S is the entropy. W is what? That's the possible number of microstates consistent with a given macrostate. That's what W is. Now, what the second law says is S, the entropy, has to increase or stay the same. That means the number of microstates has to increase or stay the same. So another way, really fundamental way of thinking of the second law is that the complexity of the universe at the micro level must increase with time. Okay, okay. That's that the real sense. way to think about entropy. And so then in our minds and in our computers and things like that, we are expending energy to basically direct that. We're directing those patterns and reducing entropy overall, potentially, right? You're reducing, no, you're reducing entropy here in the brain, but the second law requires that you have to increase it even more somewhere else. It's the yeah. entropy of the universe that has to increase with time. You can always decrease it locally. The first use of the second law was the uh, Carnot theorem, even before they had the strict uh, concert, uh, uh, notion of entropy, in which he deduced the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine. And what is a heat engine? Well, a heat engine for Carnot, he abstracted it to its basics. You have a hot source of high temperature energy, and you're going to dump some of the energy into a coal reservoir. Now, what if you look through the mathematics, what is happening is that in extracting heat from the high temperature reservoir, you're actually decreasing the entropy of that high temperature reservoir. That's fine if you increase the entropy by dumping heat into the coal reservoir, you increase its entropy even more or stay the same. Maximum efficiency is staying the same. No change in entropy. Any change in which you have an entropy increase means less than maximum possible efficiency in the Carnot heat engine. The bottom line is that you can decrease the entropy here, provided you increase it even more elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Well, Frank, let me thank you so much for your time today. We have just taken a jaunt through so many tremendous ideas. And, you know, I would love to have you back on in the future. We could go over this again if you're open to it. And sure uh, again, so many enormous ideas and we just surf through them. So let um, me mention one thing. You were going to ask this question, and I think your readers would want to know. It is observed that the universe is accelerating now. Yeah. And 
that the evidence from many different sources shows that it's accelerating. If the acceleration continues, the Omega point theory collapses. But unitarity requires the universe to collapse. So how can it collapse if it's going to accelerate? That depends on what the dark energy, which is the cause of the acceleration, actually is. Now, there is a natural explanation inside the standard model of particle physics, which has survived every attempt to refute it over the past 60 years. So I assume that it's true. It tells us that what the dark energy must be is a slight difference between the positive cosmological constant, which comes from quantum gravity, and a negative effective cosmological constant, which comes from the Higgs field, which permeates the universe according to the standard model. Now, if you look carefully at the very early universe, a process in the standard model creates more matter than antimatter. That's one of the problems of modern physics, yeah. and it's automatically solved once again by that wonderful standard model with the appropriate boundary conditions on the initial um, singularity. It automatically will create more baryons, almost entirely baryons, very little um, anti-baryons. But in the process of creating it, it creates a slight increase of the vacuum over the entire universe. And if you go out and annihilate baryons by reversing the process that happened in the early universe, and our descendants one day will get around to that, this is... Um, Something like using matter antimatter, but more efficiently. You're converting matter directly into energy. Um, by doing this, what you're doing is you are turning off the dark energy. Uh -huh. So this is the mechanism whereby the dark energy will be turned off, whereby the acceleration will be turned off, and the universe will collapse into the omega point final singularity. Frank, let me thank you so much for your time today sir and perhaps we'll see each other again take care <laughs>